All right, folks. I'm going to get us started. Gave us a couple minutes for people to make their way from class here. Um, and I know that we have a whole bunch of folks on Zoom as well. So a warm welcome to those of you that are remote. Um, welcome to today's Dean's Lecture, which we are unbelievably fortunate to co-sponsor with a Pointer Fellowship in Journalism here at Yale. For those who are not familiar, the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism was established in 1967 by Nelson Pointer to bring distinguished journalists to Yale to provide insight on their work and its relationship with culture within the Yale community. Today, we are honored to hear from journalist, professor, and Pointer Fellow, Linda Villarosa. We are all unbelievably excited and honored to have you speak today and to join us here at the Yale School of Public Health. So for those who are not familiar with Linda, she is what I would consider to be one of the most ingenious and innovative public health journalists of our time. As a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, she has a history of investigating stories and topics at the intersection of race, inequity, and public health. As one among many examples, she stirred a national conversation about maternal and infant mortality, which of course is a thing that we all discuss um, frequently here at the School of Public Health, um, back in 2018 after publishing a New York Times Magazine article titled, Why America's Black Mothers and Babies Are in a Life or Death Crisis. So when you hear maternal and child health and the disparities in um, maternal and child health for Black women discussed, it is in large part thanks to Linda shining a light on this issue from what many would consider to be among the world's most prominent journalistic stages um, back uh, over half a decade ago. She's also, as I'm sure she's going to talk about today, the author of Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and on the Health of Our Nation, which among many, many other honors was a finalist for the 2023 Pulitzer Prize, one of the top 10 books of 2022, according to the New York Times Book Review, um, and has won honors from NPR and others as well. Alongside all this work, uh, she's a professor at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, City University of New York, where she received her own degree, and she teaches journalism, English, and Black Studies at the City College of New York. So as all of you have heard me say many times, I consider communication to be one of the core pillars of our work as public health teachers, scholars, and practitioners. Um, when we think about the future of public health, or to that is our ability to translate the science that we are learning or creating into actionable insights for individuals, families, and communities, and to contextualize that science in the culture and in the community in which people sit and live. And so having someone like Linda join us here today, I hope will be an inspiration for each of us as we bring this pillar forwards in our own study or practice of public health, and as we think together about how to create a more just and healthy society. I'm also going to very briefly, before I turn the table over, turn the mic over to Linda, um, introduce also Neil Bayer, who is gonna be moderating us today. Um, Dr. Bayer is an award-winning showrunner, television writer and producer, physician and author. He's also a lecturer in our own Department of Chronic Disease, EPI, and is co-director of the master's degree program in media medicine and health at Harvard Medical School. We'll forgive you, the competitor. He recently served as executive producer and showrunner of Designated Survivor and as the executive producer of Baking Impossible, both on Netflix. Nutrition is a big part of health, as we all know. And from my own perspective as an ER doctor, he was part of the inspiration for why many from my generation went into emergency medicine um, by being uh, one of being showrunner for the NBC television series, Law and Order uh, Special Victims Unit, as well as, of course, ER. Um, I will share, Neil, uh, I broke um, uh, or I severely sprained my ankle when I was an intern and was going around with kind of a boot and a cane. And everyone's like, oh, you're like Dr. Weaver, was the, the message that everyone kind of gave me. So thank you for your work as well, and, and also a great exemplar of how you communicate and shape the world through stories. So honored to have you joining us as well. With that, Linda, I will turn it over to you. Um, we're all excited to be inspired. Thank you. Oops. All right, well, um, 
I am so excited to be here. And thank you for all the collaborations that made my visit possible and all the help I had getting here. Um, I'm going to, should I get rid of that little? <laughs> Me, don't touch anything, <laughs> you, you non-mechanical person. <laughs> Well, I'm, <laughs> not you, me. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm apparently not mechanical too. There we go. Got it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a copy of the cover of my book because one time I gave a lecture where um, the person that introduced me was so overwhelmed and forgot to say the title of the book. So there it is. <laughs> a little public service ad. <laughs> All right. This is a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that's used a lot during Black History Month, which is this month, and especially in talks, the kind that I give about health. Of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. But it's actually not correct here. Um, I think it was from a professor a few years ago who actually listened to the recording of Dr. King's speech in the mid 60s. And it was actually of all forms of inequality, injustice in health, not healthcare, is the most shocking and inhuman, not inhumane. So that really makes it worse. And that is sort of the basis of my talk today. This is um, America is the wealthiest country in the world. It, we spend um, the most on healthcare of any country, about $12,000 per year. Um, which is very expensive, but money doesn't buy good health for us. So in general, we have the highest rate of infant and maternal mortality compared to the other wealthy countries. We have the lowest life expectancy and the highest rate of avoidable death of compared to other wealthy countries. And when COVID, you know, in the midst of the COVID epidemic, we were the ones with the worst death rate. And often when we talk about these questions, it's sort of like a mystery. And it's sort of like, why would we be so rich, but have even, you know, overall, the worst health outcomes? And obviously the first answer, but it's not complete, but the first answer is we don't have universal health care. Um, health care should be a human right. Everyone should have access to that and it should be equal, which, in this country, it, it isn't. But even if everyone had access to health care in our country, we would still have inequality in many areas. And the one I care about the most and have studied the most is race. So black Americans lives the quick, the easiest way to say it is we live sicker and die quicker than anyone else, other groups. And it starts at the beginning of life and goes all the way to the end. It starts with um, what um, we, you know, I've written about is maternal and infant mortality. Um, a black birthing person is three to four times more likely to die or almost die related to pregnancy and childbirth compared to white people. And black babies are about two and a half times more likely to pass away before the age of one. If you look at black women compared, you know, if we were our own country compared to other much poorer countries, our rate of maternal mortality would be much higher. We also have lower life expectancy and it was getting better until COVID. Um, it used to be uh, black people lived an average of about three and a half years less and it went up to six um, post pandemic. So that's a very big life expectancy gap. So the long standing explanation is always two things that it's related to poverty and it's related to lack of access to medical care. And while those things are true, that there is a relation that is not the whole answer. So let's start with poverty. Sorry, this is my, I have this really cool um, researcher who's updating all my slides, but she hasn't finished. <laughs> so this is life, ex this is poverty um, by race in 2020. So black people have high poverty rates in the United States, about 20%. However, this is the poverty rate was so much higher. I'm gonna just say my age. I was born in 1959. And the poverty rate was much higher in 1959, about 
then for black people. Then it plummeted after the civil after civil rights movement to 40%, and now it's 20. So look at the rate, it's just gone straight down. Yet the health outcomes have not improved. Plus, this is the statistic, this is the data point that really got me going on maternal and infant mortality, that a black birthing person with a college degree, so that means everything from just an undergraduate degree to a master's degree to a PhD to an MD to a JD, is more likely to die or almost die than her white counterpoint with an eighth grade education. And then the New York Times put it in sharper relief recently, about a year ago, exactly a year ago, and called it, talked about wealth. I work there basically. And the New York Times doesn't use the word rich much. You know, rich is way too um, sort of casual, but this is the headline. Childbirth is deadlier for black families even when they're rich. So that is saying something, that this is not just a question. Healthcare disparities in racial health disparities in the United States are not simply because of poverty. So if it's not poverty and it's not a lack of access to health care, and I, I had this interesting um, discussion, I think it was maybe with a group here, and we were talking about um, sort of the lack of access to health care. And it was, they were saying, if we could just get more people into our clinic. And then I was saying, mm, from my experience, when pe people, black people that I've talked to, regular people are saying, we do not get treated well when we get into the system. So just getting us access is not helpful in an unequal system. But what happens if it's not lack of access to healthcare and if it's not poverty, then it becomes blame. It's something you as a group are doing wrong. Your starts with genetics. Is something wrong with your body or is something wrong with you? So I asked this question, but I know the answer is, no. So we can almost move on from that. But physiological differences still remain an answer for some to health, racial health disparities based on the ideas that Black people are, Black bodies are inferior. And that is an old myth that comes from the years of enslavement. This picture is um, from the Justice um, Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, and I love it. I go there every year, I'll be there in two weeks. Um, if you haven't been there, it's um, really beautiful. So this myth has stuck around for um, centuries. The idea that black people have some kind of superhuman into uh, tolerance to pain. Um, it was used to justify cruelty and it includes emotional pain. So that is really hard because it justified breaking up families, taking, um, killing people in front of you, lynching um, because of the idea that we had a different kind of pain tolerance, including emotional pain. This is um, J. Marion Sims. Um, I have to now say the so-called father of modern gynecology because he's been so widely criticized, but um, we still use, we um, people in medicine still use the Sim speculum named after him. Um, he practiced in the 1800s. This is a famous painting of his, um, Anarcha, Betsy and Lucy were the three enslaved women that he practiced on. He practiced on them without anesthesia, but there was no anesthesia at the beginning, but even when there was anesthesia, he still practiced on them without using it under the false notion that black people don't feel pain the same way. Um, he was trying to come up with and did come up with um, a cure for fistula, which is an extreme side effect of uh, pregnancy. This painting is very famous and it's used to illustrate his um, medical breakthrough. But what it doesn't say is that he tortured these women in order to um, figure out an, a, you know, an answer to his medical um, question. This is a 2016 survey, but there have been many others that, that prove or um, are say that these myths are still hanging around. This is a survey of medical students and about 40% of them believed at least one myth 
about black bodies in 2016. And one of them was the myth that black people have higher um, tolerance to pain. And there have been many others um, since then, but this is the one that really stands out because it's medical students. So it's not even sort of people who maybe don't know better. It should be people who are learning um, that these medical myths are wrong. Okay, so if it's not genetics, then usually it's you as a, a group of people are doing something wrong. Certainly we should all be doing everything right. Um, we should be helping each other to drink water, to exercise, to eat right, to get a lot of sleep, to take care of ourselves. But even people, black people, people of color, but black people especially that have good health habits still may have poorer health outcomes. Again, blaming someone for um, what's going on with them is a stereotype meant to reinforce inferiority and justify free labor in our country. This is one of the worst of the stereotypes and it's that black women especially are angry. It's like all black people are angry and for many reasons we should be, but the idea that you're just automatically angry um, when you're not smiling is a stereotype and a myth that's old. And this is, there are so many, when Michelle Obama was the first la lady, there were so many of these kinds of pictures. It's like, why is she so angry? It was like, she's just thinking, concentrating. This is one, it's, you know, before Serena Williams retired from tennis, these were the kinds of cartoons. If she was someone who um, said, mm, I don't think that call was fair, it became, she's so angry, she's so mad. If you are playing at the highest levels of tennis, you should uh, question calls and you shouldn't be called angry each time you do it. But this was the stereotype. And that stereotype had a price for her specifically. When she had her first child several years ago, I think she's about five now, um, she went into the hospital. She went into what she's super wealthy. She's married to the person who founded Reddit. Um, so clearly they are not lacking access to healthcare, but when she went to have her baby, um, she had what turned into what should have been one of the best days of her life turned into one of the worst because of how she was treated her legitimate concerns. She had a health condition that she tried to communicate were shut down. I think, and many think, and she thinks because she was viewed as not being a proactive in the birthing room, but being angry. The baby's fine, she had a second baby, um, but um, I, that is an unforgettable moment. This is Dr. Susan Moore. So in 2020, she contracted COVID. She's a black physician in Indiana. Um, that's her, I think it's her medical school graduation photo. And um, she posted a Facebook Live of herself at the end of 2020 and um, saying, that she was in the hospital for COVID. She was trying to communicate what was going on. She tried to communicate that she had pain in her shoulder and she was treated as though she were drug seeking. And um, so she ended up leaving that hospital and died. She didn't make it. And when there was an investigation of the hospital, they found out part of the investigation revealed that part of the reason she did not receive the kind of care she deserved is because the hospital, um, the some of the hospital personnel perceived her as being hostile, even though she was just trying to say, I'm a doctor, I'm trying to get good care. And the refrain on her Facebook Live video, which you can still watch, was this is how black people get killed, and she did. All right, so now the newer explanation isn't that it's there's something about race or being black or having a black body or doing something wrong as a demographic that is a risk factor for racial health disparities, but racism as a risk marker for ill treatment. And this took me a minute to grasp because even the title of my book didn't have racism in it until later I changed it because I thought this, it's more accurate to say racism rather than to say race. Okay, so there's the <laughs> new title, that's the paperback. Um, 
So to explain poor health outcomes among Black Americans, there are three things. One is that battling discrimination in the day-to-day -day causes wear and tear on the body, a kind of premature aging. Two, century, centuries of sanctioned discrimination in our society has made Black communities less healthy. And three, racism in the medical system harms Black people. So I'm just going to go through the three things. Weathering is a term um, coined by Dr. Arlene Geronimus. She is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She, her idea that she came up with was that, um, I love the subtitle of her book. She didn't have, when I first met her in 2018, she didn't have a book. No one was really listening to her. We had this great phone conversation um, that lasted like hours. And I was like, why is she on the phone so long with a New York Times Magazine writer? And I realized she is not used to being interviewed. No one is listening to her. Now they are <laughs> because you saw during COVID that, th that Black Americans as a group had um, death rates and hospitalization rates at a younger age, at 10 years younger. And part of it was blamed on this accelerated aging that came as a result of dealing with everyday stress. So if you are confronted by stressors, whether it's small, someone's like, you know, put you seated in the back in a restaurant, which just happened to me. So I had to get all angry and say, um, you know, this is a nice restaurant. I had this reservation a month ago. Can you please not put me in the back by the kitchen in the bathroom? And certainly who knows if that is related to race, but that happens to me so often, <laughs> I don't know. Um, or if you're being something small like that, still makes your body change. Or if you're being discriminated by police in housing or at your workplace, it causes over time a kind of accelerated aging that Arlene Geronimus called weathering. And it's the same way a storm might weather a house but it also speaks to resilience and lasting and the same way a house weathers the storm. I think about that in my own family. That's me um, sitting on my dad's lap. Don't I look like my dad's little twin there? Um, and in 1968, we moved from Chicago to Denver. Um, my family packed up the car and we were going to this wonderful knew we could have our own rooms, a real house, not an apartment on the south side of Chicago. My parents had picked out the house. When we got there, written on the garage was in word, go home. So my mom, my dad wanted to go back, just get in the car, go back to Chicago. My mom said, let's stay. We bought this house. We earned this house. We should stay. They, the neighbors helped us scrub it off. But we found out that two boys not next door, but the house next to our next door neighbors had done it. Um, they were my age. So I had to go to school with them all through. We went to every elementary, middle school, high school together. Um, and I think about that a lot of what that felt like because it was supposed to be such a happy thing and it turned so terrible for our family. And I thought, hmm. And I thought about it when I got pregnant that is my daughter, who's a young adult now, but she was born at four pounds, 13 ounces. So she was low birth weight. It was a, you know, what some people would call a near miss. Someone like me at the time, I was the health editor of Essence. I was like the poster person of good health. I did every single thing right. But still, I often think back to that inward go home on our garage and thinking of living next so close to those boys who did it and think of you know my childhood largely happy in denver but what was the result of you know kind of the everyday racism that i was dealing with maybe it was having a near miss but i'm glad it's not a near miss that is my child um but i think about that a lot was i a person who experienced weathering and i bring that personal experience into my own writing the second is the social determinants of health. People here know what that means, but in the real world, social determinants of health isn't like the nicest way uh, or the easiest way or the most makes the most sense to what you're really describing is the environment where people live. 
So it's access to healthy food. It's access to clean air and water. It's access to a safe place to exercise. It is um, housing that's safe. It's safety in general. Um, black communities, communities of color, but especially black communities are more likely to live in a um, community that is historically redlined, that what that has, doesn't have good social determinants of health, doesn't have all those safeties. And the thing, the statistic that gets me the most is that black communities are 75% more likely to, to be situated near a polluting facility, whether it's a refinery, a landfill, um, you know, something that is polluted. I just came from um, visiting my extended family in Texas and um, where my partner grew up, she's in a fence line community in, tech, in you know, East Texas. And I said to her, let's walk. Cause I don't, you know, a fence line's a mile. Um, that's what's called fence line. We walked, it was two blocks and it was this giant refinery and you could see it. And I thought, oh, I can't believe this is where um, this really wonderful community is situated. That is also personal to me, um, life ex thinking about life expectancy. My mother is from Inglewood in Chicago. That's where we moved from, where people live to only age 60. Nine miles north, um, they, people, the more the white community, live to age 90. This is you know current. And I looked, my mom and I went back in 2020, right before the pandemic, to Chicago. And I said, let's walk around. I want to see where you grew up. So we walked around um, the community in Inglewood and she all the places that she took me were gone, including her elementary school. And she was very proud to go to Betsy Ross Elementary School. She was like, that's the lady who made the flag. And um, Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet, went to that elementary school. Lorraine Hansberry went to that elementary school, right in smack in the middle of the south side of Chicago. It had police tape on it. It was gone. It, there was no more elementary school. But so many of the landmarks were gone in this community that um, was really a promised land for so many Black people who came up during the Great Migration. But it was redlined. And it also, once redline in, redlining came, then Black people had their money from coming up from the South, couldn't buy a home. A home is your biggest wealth asset. Um, so that meant that they were subject to contract buying. That meant that if you were black, you could buy a home if you paid more. Um, you could never really own it outright because you couldn't get a mortgage by the bank, from the bank. So I said to my mom, how did our grandfather and our ancestors get this house? I don't get it. That's the house, um, which is, was actually fine. It was still there. And they, my mom said, I don't remember on some kind of contract. Your grandfather was always terrified he would lose his home. So if you are in a community that is discriminated against, sanctioned discrimination, then it's very hard for people to live healthy lives. All right, here's the third thing is discrimination in the healthcare system itself. I was on a panel with two, um, Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and me, and we were talking about you know, this idea of access to healthcare. And I was talking about, well, there's discrimination in this healthcare system, what I said earlier. And the doctors were saying, well, we actually need more data on that. We need more evidence. I'm not someone who is rude, but I was like, we need no more evidence, come on. <laughs> Unequal treatment that was uh, published uh, 2000, in 2003, it was actually written in 2003, published this year. It's the 20th anniversary of unequal treatment. So there will be a report coming out probably in the summer that looks at 20 years later. But it looked at 483 other studies of discrimination in the healthcare system. And most of the studies, if you look at them, it was matched by income and matched by severity of disease. The one that got to me was about amputation. So it looked at diab diabetic patients by everyone had about the same severity of the illness and everyone, I think they were all Medicaid. So everybody had the same access to healthcare, yet black people were much more likely to have an amputation. So why, why would that be? I do not think healthcare providers go into this um, profession, I would never say that, to harm. 
do no harm, but something is going on in the healthcare system that makes it dangerous for black people. That's, you saw my father before, that's him. Um, he was a veteran in 1999. I got a call, I was pregnant with my second kid. I got a call from my mom, said, "Come, you need to come home to Denver immediately. I, I said, okay. She said, put on your nicest clothes. I'm gonna meet you at the airport. So I, I said, what's going on? She said, your dad is much sicker than he has let on. He's in the hospital. So I got on the plane, all dressed up, my mom meets me and I said, what is going on? Why are we dressed up? What's happening? She said, your dad is very ill. They're treating him like N-word, same word that was on the garage. So we go to the hospital and he insisted on a veteran's hospital. So we went to the, the veteran's hospital in Denver. My dad, who was like super well-dressed, he was a scientist. He got his bachelor's degree in um, bacteriology. He worked, he used to work for the Veterans Administration, was in the hospital. He was super, looked a mess. His, he was wearing a dirty gown. He was really agitated. So I went up to him and I said, what's going on? And I remember he said, get me out of here. He, I looked down, he was shackled to the bed. He had restraints. My dad is, loves fishing. Fishing can be really boring. So you have to be super patient. My dad is not an angry person, but he was agitated and they had to restrain him to the bed. My mom and I went to his house. We got pictures of him in that naval uniform. We told them about his degree in bacteriology. We explained to them that he is not like this usually, but if you are not treating him kindly, like anyone, he would be upset and agitated. But if you are black and you do that, you seem dangerous. We got him out of there. He, like Dr. Moore, he didn't survive too much longer. But I always thought, why did we have to dress up? Why did we have to show this respectability just to get good care? Why did we have to prove that my dad was educated in middle class? Why did we have to do that? Why was he treated so poorly? Because there is something in the healthcare system that affects people of color negatively, especially Black people. Okay, so we're not gonna, you know, stick on this, all the negatives. Let's talk about what's going on. This is a, this was signed to law, this act was signed to law, law in 2019. Unfortunately, that, you know, what happened in 2020, but this said, part of this law in California said that if you work with a birthing person um, in, dur during pregnancy, during childbirth, or in the year after, you have to go through some kind of anti, you know, bias or, you know, racial, tr racial dignity training. I don't even know if that's the answer to this question, but at least it's a try. Now, if you work in healthcare in the state, you have to go through some kind of training. And we don't know if it's working yet. There's been so much that's happened, including the pandemic, that we're not, we're not sure. It's something that I'm really interested in looking into. Maybe some of you are in um, White Coats for Black Lives, um, which is a really interesting group um, of activist medical students. So I love, and it's not just medical students, it can be nursing students, it can be public health students. It's um, healthcare providers and thinkers of the future who want to forge a different path. This is the Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine write that down if you are in medical school, if you are in public health school, this is a wonderful group that's based in California. I'm basic, I'm kind of a honorary member because I go to their meetings and I listen to their um, wonderful talks and they really want to do better and they want to be different kinds of healthcare providers. Doulas, patient navigators, community health workers provide a loving link between the healthcare system, which can be cold and clinical and technical, and the patient. And um, I work with them, doulas especially, patient navigators, community health workers, in my own practice as a journalist. Um, this is activism. This is Dr. Sims's statue in um, Central Park. 
which after sustained activism, these are people dressed like Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy. The statue was taken down a couple of years ago um, in Montgomery, Alabama, where Dr. Sims did most of his practice. The statue is still up. This is a counter protest called the Mothers of Gynecology. That's Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. The woman with the red glasses is Michelle Browder. She's the artist. Um, she's taken us gone a step further now and bought the land that J. Marion Sims Clinic was on and is opening her own clinic and museum. So if you're in Montgomery, Alabama, you need to go there. She also did this counter painting, this protest painting, which is super cheeky and really wonderful. <laughs> and then finally, um, I taught pre-med uh, last year and these are my students. And um, I see a lot of hope in the next generation of healthcare providers, including many of you. Thank you. That's great. We're both from Denver. Yes. <laughs> So I'm going to um, ask, we'll have time for a question or two, and then we'll open it to you all. I'm sure you'll have questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now that was terrific, so inspiring. Um, I always talk to my students about Linda's work because I talk to um, my students about Linda's work because she always starts with data, and I say, find something that angers you, inflames you, moves you, saddens you, and then design the emotional story based on the data and then um, move on to action. And you really illustrate that with the action part at the end of, of your talk. So I'm just gonna ask one question because I wanna open it uh, up to you all, but um, what kinds of partnerships, um, Dean Ranny and, and Linda, do you think uh, schools of public health should be undertaking um, to involve storytellers and artists? Like what can we do um, as a school of public health or um, medical schools to to really draw on the work that storytellers and artists do. What kind of partnerships could we form? I think um, part of the work uh, is starting with the community and letting people tell their own stories. And it you know, sort of this is a movement, and I've seen some of this and. Some of it, you know, you do it here in some areas where um, you're listening to people tell their own stories. Um, I love it when the going to the next level um, at the Yale School of Nursing, where I was a judge in the um, their writing contest. It was beautiful to see the stories that um, sort of and creative activity around public health and around storytelling. And I think that that is really wonderful. A lot of medicine, uh, a lot of people who are interested in medicine are also good writers and artists, which is sort of like sometimes gets pushed down, but is actually very true. Um, and I think that that is something that should, instead of being sort of pushed aside, should be lifted up. I, I love that. And I also want to say to those who are standing in the back, there is room up front and feel free to scoot your way in. There are seats up in the very front and there's a bunch of seats in the back. Feel free to stand if you're more comfortable that way, but I just want to offer. Um, so I totally agree. I think to me, partnership around storytelling is first and foremost about saying that this is part of our work. Um, and I've not given lectures here about kind of violence, but when I do my lectures about violence as a public health problem, I usually end with a slide, which is that step one is knowing the facts. Step two is sharing the stories. And then the third step is combining those first two to create action. We're not going to be inspired to take action based off of facts alone, at least most of us humans are not, that it's the stories that situate the facts and that do give us that kind of 
personal um, grounding and reminder about why we're doing this. Um, but that requires us to value storytelling as part of our curriculum and our practice. Um, it, it, not to devalue rigorous research or data, but to say that stories hold an equal place with data and that people who are primarily storytellers have an important place in academia, in schools of public health, and in the practice of public health, just as much as people who are rigorous gatherers and analyzers and presenters of data. Um, I really appreciate your comment about also amplifying the voices of those with lived experience, because I also think one of our tendencies sometimes in academia is to think that we are the ones who can speak on behalf of. And so the last part to me is creating the spaces where those with whom we work have the chance to share their stories, um, which is perhaps one of the best forms of kind of empowerment and change uh, that we can create. So I'd love to hear, I don't know if you have examples of kind of places, I, I loved how you shared your own personal stories, which I guess sometimes uncomfortable for many of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you have kind of thoughts or examples on folks that you've seen maybe at CUNY or elsewhere that have done particularly good jobs of, of empower, working in partnership with communities. Uh, I went back to New Orleans after I had written my maternal and infant mortality uh, story was situated there. And I had thrown a lot of shade on <laughs> two of the hospitals. So I went back and um, to see what they were doing to improve things. And one of them had started a, um, it was a partnership and bringing in people from the community who had both had something they felt like they had had harm caused by their experience and also who had had a positive experience and they brought them in. And so my friend snuck me into the, it was during, it was during zoom time. And so I was in this little square with no name watching. And it was really interesting to see the people, you know, there was a woman who really had been treated poorly and she told her story. And so, some of the people in the zoom room were in the room when she was treated badly. And then another person told her positive story where the healthcare provider snapped into action, kind of um, brought in by a doula who had, she had called the doula, help me, I'm having a miscarriage, and then brought in um, really fast for care. And then as a result of that sort of storytelling by the people from the community, they realized that they needed an obstetric emergency room. So when they get up off money, you know that it has worked. So it took, they had to hire four people and find the space for this obstetric emergency room. And it, you know, now that hospital has that. So we talk about storytelling um, today, but storytelling encompasses journalism, but also poetry and documentary films and music and VR and gaming and TikTok. So it's it's not a, a, a limited way. It's finding your own passion and what you um, feel comfortable with in order to um, tell stories that will have an impact. For me, we did uh, opening the backlog of rape kits when I talked to a woman in, from the community in New York City who was afraid to leave her apartment after she'd been sexually assaulted because she found out her kit, which can take four to six hours, uh, uh, getting all of the DNA evidence, another invasion of of that person's body, um, but needing to be done, she found out that the kits were not being tested and open. And so we told a story on the show, but we gave people um, access to a kit they could go to their chief of police or their um, um, city council in order to open the backlog in their community. So there are many ways to approach public health and, and storytelling. And I do think the research shows that we do pay attention to emotional stories. You all love music, poetry, novels, plays, dance, opera, television shows. So it's it's a way of, of grounding, as, as Dean Ranney said, the data, and then into the work that we're doing to motivate people, I call it bridging the gap between inspiration and action so that they take action. So Linda is a great example of the work that she's done. And I think it's so important what she said that ending her talk with the actionable steps that are going on. So um, 
we're going to open it to you all. Um, any questions? Um, yes. Talking about stories and moving the data to help explanations. Stories also are data. Mm -hmm. Incorporated as so, uh, and so I think we should think about methodologically how to get to the data that has that. For those on Zoom, Trace said that we should incorporate stories as data, not just see them as ways to illustrate data. I love that. And my daughter, the one you saw in the slide, said to me, um, said that very thing to me. And I was, she's not in public health, she's not in this, but she said, when you are, every time you give a talk, someone tells you a story and that becomes a kind of data so that you, you know, you she knows I'm a numbers nerd, but she um, said you you shouldn't just think of your book as you know for um, medical students or public health students or as something a form of education, but also as a form of lifting up and confirming um, the stories of real people that you know share them with you. We talk a lot in our courses about with Judy Lichtman and my courses about participatory storytelling. So. Now, particularly with phones, fortunately around the world, people can take their own pictures, they can make their own documentaries, and then they can share them. So that is another way of sharing one's own story, one's own data to make a difference. And it's important, as, as um, Dean Ranney and, and, and Linda were saying, that, um, that people tell their own stories too. And how can a school of public health um, secure that and... Um, and support that and honor that is, is critically important. Another question. And for the, while well, we're doing the question, for those who are students here, there, we have some wonderful qualitative and mixed methods courses. Uh, if you have not taken them and are interested in this in, a doc, in addition to Dr. Lickman's and Dr. Bayer's course. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. Um, from the perspective of somebody who uh, like is learning about public health, something that has been like shown to me multiple times is that in America, there's disparities within states. And like I'm from California, so I tend to have a perception that healthcare there is slightly better or if like compared to most places. And also, I felt like coming from that area, there were more opportunities to be involved with the community and also just like participate in these types of things. But are there ways that you can contribute and like make contribute to some sort of real impact in areas of the USA where like public health is not as great and it's farther away from you? I think that's a, an excellent question. And that's why I really love what Michelle Browder's doing in Alabama, which is a state not like California. It has, you know, really bad, you know, the social determinants of health in Montgomery, Alabama are not good. Um, there are parts that look like rural areas right in cities. Certainly Jackson, Mississippi, where I spent a lot of time, um, is not a place where uh, you see a lot of healthful living. You see, um, I remember waiting for the bus for like an hour to get to the clinic. The clinic wasn't bad, but the bus system was so terrible. Um, so I think I love that Michelle Browder is doing artwork in Mississippi, I mean, in Alabama. Um, I saw so, the really wonderful HIV AIDS clinic in Jackson, Mississippi was one of the most sort of state of the art thinking at least, and actually was quite good. But it took some people pushing really hard in the state that got rid of abortion um, and the poorest state in the country to do that. So I think it's harder in states where you're trying to convince, um, you know, the government that this is a good thing, where you're trying to get money from a nonprofit or philanthropy to get it done. But I think that's, these are the areas where it's most needed. I'll add on a couple things to that. The first is while you're here as a student, again, learn those rigorous methods, which you'll be able to take with you no matter where you go. Second, do not hesitate to get involved with our local New Haven community. Jason Martinez, if you can raise your hand, is sitting up here from our Office of Public Health Practice, um, which as many of you know, is a huge part of our school and hopefully of your educational experience. 
Um, I spent this morning with Jason um, at the Greater New Haven Health Partnership, um, which is a partnership between United Way, the hospital system, our School of Public Health, and multiple local community-based organizations, including Data Haven, which was founded um, by a guy who's a grad of Yale School of Public Health, who has dedicated his life to gathering data that represent neighborhoods and communities, shining light on inequities in communities within Connecticut, where we see huge disparities, like you talked about in Chicago, we see huge disparities between, you know, one zip code and the next between one town and the next. So Data Haven both gathers that data and then empowers communities to be part of the gathering of the data and then part of the storytelling about what the data shows and then part of creating action on what they're most concerned about, knowing that what you and I might think is the most important may not actually be the thing that most concerns the folks that are living in that community. So take advantage of those opportunities while you are here and then bring them back with you to whatever community is or whatever issue it is that you care most about in the world. And that's the hope of us here at the school is that you all go out and create amazing change in a thousand different places in a thousand different ways in partnership rather than kind of doing that like savior complex and, and parachuting in and, and use your opportunity here as a student to start to practice those skills with humility um, in partnership, either here locally or with the community that you come from. Yes, I, I want to echo that, that, you know, find your passion, find your data points, and then figure out a way to tell that story using the community as your um, laboratory, so to speak, to participate and work with them and tell your story. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, my uh, medical school classmate, Monique Rainford, who is a professor and an OBGYN at, at um, uh, Yale Medical School. And she took her passion about Black women's um, pre and postnatal outcomes, as Linda had been writing about. And they certainly talked a lot. And Monique wrote a book. Um, your book is <laughs> Isn't it while black? So um, I really recommend it. And and it was great how Monique took her passions, what she really cares about, and wrote a book about it. So you can all do that too. Another question. Hi, thank you so much <clears throat> for coming in to speak with all of us today and sharing your stories. And it's super um, impactful. And um, I guess my question is, um, could you talk a little bit more about maybe some of the critiques or counterpoints to, you know, some of the um, your the data or the statistics or the stories um, that you, you've written um, from people who have had maybe come to different conclusions or have assumed a different sort of ideological uh, stance and that you felt were legitimate or valid criticisms of, of the work and what your thoughts are on some of that? Um, I often get critiques from physicians. And it starts with, you're not a physician. So, well, I said, well, maybe that's a good thing that I'm coming in from the outside, so to speak, and um, looking in. I, um, I, I oh, just get, getting into a debate about whether I have to do it next month um, with a friend of mine who is at your school, um, but uh, she trained at Harlem Hospital. And there is one of this group of doctors that all train together. And one of them believes that we should still be race correcting for in the uh, spirometer because black people as a group have lower lung function. That is pretty much been <laughs> unvalidated, but this is a physician still practicing who believes it. And he said, no, black people have lower lung function. He's bringing in some studies. So now I am on a mission to outstudy him um, and out debate him. We had, I definitely had a um, conversation about the kidney function, race correction, the EGFR. It's still in practice. Somebody said, no, no, we're not use using that anymore. I brought out my, from eight months ago, I had a race correction on my own kidney function. It said, black, white, and my black was circled. Um, and that is based on an old myth that um, black people as a demographic have more muscle mass, thus more creatinine. Um, and it actually makes a falsely positive kidney function. Um, and mostly it's gone, you know, it's been debated a lot and should have gone out of practice, but still is, you know, pushed back against that, certainly. And I will get, if you could see my email, 
sometimes I don't see it because I just get tired of sometimes when I'm getting too much pushback and it's like, oh, I just don't feel like doing a smackdown with this person that I don't know. So. So we're going to thank you for your your uh, question. There's a good piece about this in the New England Journal, maybe about a year or two ago by David Jones about the racism behind those uh, lab uh, uh, results. Um, so thank you so much, Linda and Megan, for this really enlightening morning. Um, I hope it's uh, inspired you like it always re-inspires me to, to hear Linda speak. So I'll, I'll turn it over for concluding remarks from Megan Rainey. Thank you. Well, I know that many of you have to go to class. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope that you carry a little bit of this forward with you and carry forward the dedication to both sharing the stories and continuing to create both qualitative and quantitative data that folks like Linda can use. And my last thing will be, don't ever be afraid to talk to a journalist. So if if nothing else out of this, they're very nice, particularly, but Not like- all of them. <laughs> well, that's true. Also true. But we'll, maybe we'll have you back and to talk about kind of how to talk to journalists to get those stories out there. So thank you all for coming. Um, have a wonderful day and a huge thank you. Lunch provided, and I should say a, a big thank you to Dr. Lichtman um, for being the organizing force behind this. Thank you to her and her happy initiative, without which this would not have happened. So thank you, Judy. Great. Go grab.